Okay, the time is now 103 Eastern, and I think that we will go ahead and get started. Um, again, my name is Marie Tilly Mironova, and I will be your moderator today for the webinar. And I'm really excited to share with you. Um, we've got a really great presentation this afternoon, your guide to back to school safety tips. And we've got some really talented, wonderful participants today. Catherine Rolf and Bob Erst Palmer will be our presenters. And from there, I'm going to turn it over to them. Um, if you have questions before we get started, there is a Q&A feature kind of in the top middle panel of your team's um, view. Go ahead and type in your questions and we will try to address as many of those as we can throughout the webinar and also at the end. Well, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, my name is Catherine Rolf. I was a uh, school teacher and principal in uh, Central Texas for um, 18 years. And then I switched gears and worked in school safety and security, first for the Texas School Safety Center uh, and then for the Texas Association of School Boards. And thank, thank you, Catherine. My name is Bob Erspalmer, and I've been in school safety and security now for about 11 years. Previous to that, uh, I was in law enforcement. I believe this is the second time that I've worked with Catherine and, and Trotto. So um, great to be here. It's hard to believe we're already, for most of us, um, starting of a new school year. So it's it's interesting because from my perception as a teacher and administrator, and of course this was uh, a number of years ago, um, we didn't do a lot with school safety at the beginning of the year because it wasn't such a hot topic. Um, I think we felt there wasn't such a need. There weren't so many incidents that had happened uh, to, to make it pressing, um, but now it is pressing. And it's important to think through um, setting yourself up in a safe way for the school year and getting all of the emergency training and uh, plans communicated, some before school starts, some as soon as school starts, because we never know when there might be an incident. It could happen the first day of school. And if you haven't practiced the correct response, your staff and students may not know what to do. So. It's it's important to look at back to school safety early in the school year um, and get started so that you can respond effectively from day one. Right, and I think it's a lot of these tips were designed for, you know, during your summer break or before school, but obviously it's never too late, especially if you haven't done these. Um, so in evaluating security measures and testing emergency technology, it's important to initiate compre comprehensive tests for all emergency technology tools to ensure their proper functionality and responsiveness during critical situations. Usually we recommend this before the first week of school, but again, um, sometimes we're a little behind the ball, so anytime is important. And you wanna consider using modern solutions such as Entrato Safety Suite for Education as, as technology evolves. Um, you know, when I started, like Catherine mentioned, everything was kind of paper and pencil, and then it evolved to technology, and it was kind of piecemeals. And that's still great on limited budgets, but at some point, again, as it evolves, we want to make sure that we have that kind of integration tool to make sure everything communicates with each other and, and runs smoothly. So specifically visitor management systems, you wanna access and test your visitor management system and confirm its effectiveness in managing and tracking visitors within your schools. Access control, you wanna conduct a meticulous check of all access control functions, including badges, intercoms, lock release mechanisms to ensure seamless operation and enhance security. And you wanna address any identified issues promptly to maintain a secure access control system. And hopefully um, by now you only have one door that guests and staff use to enter your building. Um, I noticed some schools still don't utilize that and I think it's very important that we only uh, enter our building through one door. 
Also, um, on-premise notification equipment ensure testing of on-premise notification equipment and software such as intercoms, um, wearable, mobile desktop, and mounted panic buttons to guarantee their reliability during emergencies. Conduct training sessions for staff to ensure they understand how to effectively use the notification tools in urgent situations. Test your mass notification systems and your school's emergency radios to ensure communication is being sent and received in a timely manner. I've seen this time and time again where we wait again until school starts, as Catherine mentioned, and then our radios don't work, our intercom speakers, and we're kind of scrambling. So now is the time to make sure all those systems are in place and then to test them throughout the year. And um, regarding wearable panic buttons, several states now mandate that you have a that schools have a silent alert system whether it's a wearable button or or another type of button that notifies 911 in case of an emergency um, I, I believe texas florida new jersey are a few of those states um, arizona's considering it so i think down the line, it will be required for all states. So if you don't already have it, you may want to start thinking about those types of systems. And I want to and jump in. Oh. Sure, go ahead. And I should have jumped in on the last slide, but I don't want to let it get by. Uh, you talked about testing, uh, visit, testing access control visitor management systems. Uh, and when I was with the Texas School Safety Center, one of the things that we did, and it's now required in Texas, is to do, I think they call it an intruder evaluation, but basically we would go out and go to schools and, and basically see if we could get in. Um, right. What was interesting about that, uh, my partner was male. He had a much harder time getting in than I did. Um, I People would open the door for me and let me in. They assumed I was from central office or I'm supposed to be there. And I remember one time, uh, and this, I'm sharing one time this happened, but this, in this situation, it could happen very easily. Once I was in, number one, I could let him in. But number two, uh, I, I walked down a hall and a teacher had put a, probably a third grade elementary school boy in the hall, probably for misbehavior. And the hall was empty. And so um, I asked him if he would go with me and help me carry something in from my car. And he walked with me all the way towards the door, at which point I took him back to his classroom. And, and then I just knocked on the door and said, um, can he come back in? But that's pretty scary. Um, I could have absconded with that kid very, very easily. And um, that's what we're trying to prevent. So it's really important that teachers understand, you know, while badges are not always fun to have to look at, or you feel like you're being a pain when you don't let people in, don't let people in and make sure that you're not putting a rock in front of the door because you're going back and forth, you know, carrying things or any of the other ways that we basically as human beings mess up our, uh, our visitor management and access control systems. They work hand in hand. They both have to be in place to be effective. Thanks, Catherine. And, and wow, you covered a couple of things there and, uh, that we don't cover specifically in this is stop the prop. Prop doors are, are a no-no and it's an issue on most schools throughout the country. So we always preach stop the prop. I also wanted to say that, you know, you may be in a school district or a school that doesn't have these systems in place yet, but you have some sort of system. It could be a notebook where you sign in visitors. That's still a system, and it's still something that we need to practice with your staff on how preferably uh, a digital system would, would be ideal, but you may just use a paper and pencil and you're logging in um, visitors and giving them a sticker. But to Catherine's point, um, and, and the schools that I work in, we always require at a minimum that staff has a badge on all times on our property. And you know some schools, and this is not easy, have students as well. So anybody in your school would have a badge. Um, at a minimum, I think it should be any adult in your school should have some sort of identification on, whether it's a visitor's badge or, or an employee badge. And I, I wanna add something 
uh, for uh, visitor management as well, Bob mentioned that there are a lot of schools that can't afford technology to manage visitors and access control. Access control is simply limiting uh, coming and going to one main entrance through which people are vetted. Um, when I used to visit schools to do safety audits, I would sign in in their notebook as little Miss Muffet. And then I would be at the school for three or four hours and no one ever noticed what I wrote down. I, at one time I got called over the intercom, let little Miss Muffet please come to the office. But people don't look at those. It, it's like, why are we signing in if nobody checks us out? Um, schools that don't have technological systems, probably at a minimum, um, unless the person coming in is well known to you, you know, a PTA person or what what we used to do is for people that came often, we made them badges that we kept in the office to let them wear when they came. We didn't require that they show an ID. We knew them. But someone that we didn't know would show us an ID. Our staff uh, uh, re receptionist would write their name in the book and hold the ID in a in a little card box until the person came back to check out. Because that's the other point is that um, if we don't have people check out, um, we don't know where they are or what they're doing in the school. And, you know, let's, let's say we have a situation where we need to evacuate. We're trying to check that everybody's out. Well, if they never checked out, we have to assume they were still in the school and they would need to be searched for. So, you know, the systems can be done manually or uh, with technology. Um, the technology. Yeah, yeah tools are awesome. <laughs> yeah, and that's what I was going to say. Those those manual systems are great, but I think our goal should be, especially in today's age, to work towards that technology that can that can make our lives easier. And regarding, you know, you, what you had mentioned, um, it'll do your attendance for you and everything's on your on your phone or on your app. So it's 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 very nice. Uh, reunification, attendance, and drill management programs. Again, test the operational performance of these programs. Um, reunification, if, if you do it paper and pencil again, that's fine. But again, technology makes reunification much, much easier. Uh, video surveillance, thoroughly inspect and maintain all surveillance cameras focusing on high traffic and vulnerable areas such as entryways, hallways, and parking lots. Verify that cameras cover blind spots adequately and provide clear visibility for optimal surveillance. Perform necessary maintenance tasks such as cleaning lenses and replacing cameras as required. So this, this is one I'll go on my soapbox a little bit. We tend to put up cameras and they're left there with any maintenance, um, at least in my experience. And I think it's really important. I get called to schools all the time and say our, our cameras are outdated, they don't work, this and that. A lot of times it's simply the cleaning of lenses on exterior cameras especially, uh, and, and a lot of schools don't maintain them. And it's a, you know, it's, it's a valuable asset that you have so you need to properly maintain your, your equipment. Um, you wanna also, if you're if you're replacing cameras, installing new cameras, you as a school official want to be involved in that process. A lot of schools will hire a, a a vendor that places cameras where they think are best. You need an active voice in that to determine what's best for your school. You also want to determine who's going to watch those feeds and what nece ne necessitates an alert. You want to determine how long that footage is stored for. Some it's two weeks, some it's a month, some it's longer. And again, you can work with your, your vendor for that. Ensure that your both your internal and external cameras can be easily cannot be easily accessed by unauthorized people. And um, we can't forget that, that kind of covers cameras, we can't forget fire safety measures. Obviously, fire safety is ahead of the game compared to security, so a lot of these things are in place and are mandated already, but we, we, we don't wanna forget our fire systems. We wanna test, inspect, verify proper functioning fire alarms, fire panels, smoke detectors, and fire doors to enhance safety and preparedness against fire incidents. 
You all want to address any malfunctions or deficiencies in the fire safety, safety system to promote a safe environment and talk to your fire, uh, your local fire department. They're usually more than willing to help and will come out and help you through this process. Another thing about Maria, 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 if I could, I, I know I missed a couple. You know, we talk about, and I'm sorry to interrupt, we talk about um, technology, but there's also just to consider some of the non technology items at your school, such as signage. You want proper Wayfair signage, um, addressing where visitors check in, where staff parks, where students park, that sort of thing. Um, you want to check the locks on all doors and windows. I think we touched on that a little bit. Perimeter gates, check that they're operational and that they close. And consider a numbering system for not only your doors, but your windows. It makes it much easier for first responders. And there's a lot of information online or you can contact your fire department on, on some of the requirements for that. And then Protect your utilities, um, cage fences or locks on, on, on utilities outside your school prevents tampering. And then one of the most important things and the cheapest things you can do for your safety and security is lights. Make sure your lights are properly functioning, light bulbs are changed as needed. If they're on timers, that the timers are at the appropriate times. So uh, sorry to interrupt you there, uh, Catherine, go right ahead. Um, I was just going to make another another uh, plug for working with uh, first responders, fire police, and all of those. Um, one of the schools that I was a teacher at, um, you know, uh, uh, the, our campus administrator uh, drew out how we would do evacuation drills, where we would evacuate to, and and so that's how we always did that. And then at one point we had a, a just a small fire, but uh, we all had to evacuate. And we found out that we were taking a large group of students to the place that the fire trucks were all coming to. And we were smack dab in their way. And just some simple communication can prevent that. Um, just find out, talk to them. Where Where's the best place for us to move our students to? Uh, that would be the safest and least likely to cause an issue with responders. Yeah, good point. So now let's move on to emergency operation plan. Um, some people call them emergency response plans. Uh, again, these are important. Uh, establish a, a clear timeline with your core team. So you should have a team for this, this emergency response team or crisis team or whatever you call it to review your emergency operation plan. Um, but I've, I've always said it's very, very important to conduct a vulnerability assessment. Some call it a security assessment. If you have the budget, preferably an outside consultant that can come in and assess your property. It's always nicer to have a, a different perspective on it and to give recommendations. If you can't afford that, there, there are um, tools that can help you do it, such as REMS, which you see on, on your right. Um, so you want to conduct that that vulnerability assessment, engage stakeholders, input, review and revise communication protocols, conduct conduct training and drills, and consider using a solution to digitalize and share floor plans, SOPs, emergency response che checklists, etc. If you can digitalize these, it makes it so much easier than shuffling through paper. You want to consider things when you're updating your when you're uh, doing your up your updates of your emergency plan and conducting your assessments, such as, you know, what size is your school community? What's your population of your staff and students and daily visitors? Where's your school located? Is it rural or urban? How long does it take police and first responders to arrive in an emergency? Does the school share a building with other businesses? or schools, or does it have its own campus? That's an important point. I've worked at several schools that share campuses with in a, in a business park and a um, shared with churches. So those are considerations and those are challenges um, that a standalone building doesn't, fa doesn't uh, face. Are there multiple buildings? such as mob modular units, which can create its own challenges. Are there fields, playgrounds, and other amenities? 
And does the school have dedicated security staff? We don't delve too much into your security team in this webinar, um, but do you have a school safety resource officer? And what mandates are in place? That's very important. Each state, maybe municipality, has different laws on when to conduct drills, what kind of drills you need to conduct. So you wanna make sure you're update, updated on those. And are there policies and procedures in place to ensure that security technologies are operated and maintained in a way that will maximize, maximize security benefits? Sounds good. Um, when looking at training um, stakeholders, uh, I've kind of divided them into four groups being, you know, teachers and staff at the school, students at the school, your substitute staff, or perhaps central office staff that uh, come to the school but aren't there every day, and then parents and community. And I'd like to cover um, all of these uh, separately, starting out with uh, teachers and staff. Um, when the emergency operations planning for schools first came out. These are large plans. And I think there were people that felt like, oh gosh, how are we ever going to digest all of this material? And the truth is um, teachers and staff, they don't need to know the whole plan. They need to know the parts of the plan that pertain to them, what they, what their actions are going to be and, and how their actions influence the actions of others as well. So when you're looking at um, teachers and staff, you can go to the next slide, I'm sorry. Um, you want to look into emergency response protocols. Um, what are the responses you're going to do? The drills, practicing those drills. Um, you want to give them an overview of the emergency operations plan, again, that talks about the different parts of it and uh, the information that they would need to know uh, to successfully fulfill their part in it. Um, a threat assessment overview, I think, should be part of that. Um, most schools have threat assessment uh, teams or something in place to look at students who make threats or exhibit threatening behavior or the teachers are concerned about may be a threat and teachers need to know uh, about this uh, protocol and how it works and how to report when they think a student may be uh, in trouble or may be going to cause a problem for the school. And then the reunification plan, which teachers will have a big part in, because if you remove students from the school uh, to another location, or even if you're reunifying them from the campus, um, there are lots of different jobs that need to be done, and teachers will all have a part to play in that plan. So it's- Kevin, could I, could yes. I add to you? Yeah, I just- for your, your first point that you touched on um, regarding the emergency operation plan, I agree 100% that plan should be reviewed at a minimum annually by your school leadership, um, your district staff. But at the school level, um, I, I like a system of, I call it a cheat sheet, where in your classroom you might have a folder by the door with just some emergency procedures that you may face more on a daily or monthly basis on how to do things. You don't need, as a staff member of the school, they don't need to know that whole hundred and some page document, but just a one or two page cheat sheet works, I think. Yes. Um, and then, and then threat assessment, again, we're touching a little more on technology today, but I think uh, a threat assessment team and training at your school is very important these days. And there's a lot of resources out there on, on the different types of threat assessments. There are, there are. Um, I, I will add to the, um, go back just for a second. Uh, I'm sub I'm retired, so I'm substitute teaching in my in my town, and uh, I happened to substitute on a day that they were doing uh, uh, the the schools here in this town do um, run hide fight. So they were doing a run hide fight drill, um, and they did have some information in a folder for me. Um, there was a map 
posted on the wall to help me know how to evacuate my classroom. Um, but their protocol was to have another teacher come in and basically explain the drill and run the drill for me, um, which as a sub made my job very easy. Um, and she was very, very knowledgeable. I could tell they trained their staff very, very well. Uh, the problem is if there was a real situation calling for run, hide, fight, my guess is she would not be coming in. I think she has other duties. She might not be in my vicinity in the building. Uh, you know, uh, I think it's important that as a substitute, I know those things as well. Now go ahead. <laughs> um, so uh, you do need to provide training for substitutes. And uh, it's difficult because most school districts don't even have meetings with their substitutes. You know, they require you go, you fill out an application, you might take a couple online classes, but that's about it. Um, one of the ways you might be able to accomplish this more easily is to make a short uh, training video or a training document, a little PowerPoint they can run through online to give them similar information to what you're giving your staff. Um, the tough thing is that some of these things are different depending on the building you're in, and most substitutes uh, sub at multiple buildings. But to know the types of responses, what that entails, to have that understanding uh, would be very, very good for substitute teachers. And it could be done pretty easily with either an online document or video. And then, as Bob said, make sure emergency response guides are in the subfolder where the substitute has them and can pull them out and use them, and uh, that there are maps available to show both uh, evacuation routes uh, around where I am, uh, where you take kids in the event of a tornado, and um, where is the best place for kids to hide in the classroom uh, for any kind of intruder incident. Um, so those things should be available, you know, in a cheat sheet for subs to be able to look at and and know what to do. And then I think it's always important with training, solicit some feedback, you know, find out from your substitute staff, do they feel like they know enough? Do they feel ready to respond? What is it that they think would be important to know? Um, a lot of times this kind of falls through the cracks. And I think it's important to find out if substitutes are comfortable with emergency responses. The next group that we would be training are the students. Um, and the first thing I'm going to cover is, uh, and it can be called many, many things, but to have some sort of program in place for students uh, such as see something, say something. Um, some uh, schools use some sort of an anonymous reporting system where kids can give tips to the school, uh, maybe even to local law enforcement. But kids are the eyes and ears on our campus. And if, if they notice a student um, acting strange or doing something that worries them, they're going to see it before teachers do, before staff does. And they need to have a comfortable way and be encouraged to report that kind of behavior and to, to feel like they're not ratting out their classmate, but they're hopefully, you know, maybe getting some help for that classmate and preventing them from getting themselves into trouble doing something that they shouldn't. And then, uh, again, students need to be trained in the emergency responses, evacuation, shelter in place. Um, uh, whether you do uh, uh, run, hide, fight, or, or what the intruder response is, um, uh, tornadoes, all of those need to be taught. And it's a really good idea to teach all of them the first week of school. Uh, the first week of school, I know as a former teacher, I'm handing out textbooks I'm handing out maybe some sort of an outline. I'm setting my expectations and rules, trying to get to know my students. I'm not explicitly providing instruction in my content area. 
So it's a good week to do maybe one drill every day to get all the drills covered the first week of school so that students are prepared to respond. And a good way to do that is to either provide a script or to um, let students uh, like read over the intercom how students are going to respond um, so that they know we do this response when this type of event happens, this is what it should look like. We're practicing it today so that you know what to do, then allow the kids to practice it. And again, let teachers solicit feedback if, if kids had any issue with it or have things they want to share about it. That's a very, a very good way to make sure that um, uh, students are prepared uh, with those protocols. And lastly, um, parent and community training. Um, parents worry about their kids. They see on the news about school shootings or other events, and they want to know what's going on. So providing uh, some information for them to show them that you are indeed prepared, that you take safety seriously, um, and sometimes even involving them in, um, you know, if you ever wanted to try uh, to practice a portion of a reunification drill, you can always utilize parents to help you practice that. Okay. So the next is our community partners. Um, it's important to build those relationships with community responders. So the first step in that is identify who your responders are. Uh, conduct an assessment of the community resources, including your police depart departments, fire departments, hospitals, mental health organizations, et cetera, and determine how they can help your school. Uh, consider a MOU to, to make things legal and outline the roles and responsibilities and the expectations of both the school and these responders and foster regular communication, set up regular meetings between your administrators, teachers, staff, as well as representatives from these community agencies. These meetings can provide opportunities to share information, exchange ideas, and address concerns collaboratively. Then develop joint training programs, organize joint training sessions for school staff and community responders to ensure everyone is on the same page regarding procedures and protocols. Training should cover topics like emergency response, crisis intervention, and trauma-informed care. And then develop joint training programs. Organize joint training sessions for school staff and community responders to ensure everyone's on the same page. Did I just cover that one? <laughs> Conduct drills and simulations. I'm sorry if I repeated myself. Organize drills and simulations involving both staff and community responders to protect practice coordinated responses to different scenarios. These exercises will help identify areas for improvement and build trust among stakeholders. And I wanna to add to that, that when we're talking about drills or scenarios, I would be very careful. There's different philosophies on this, but when we're doing, doing real life scenarios, at least for me, I prefer those trainings are during the summer. And the idea is to practice your emergency operation plans and responses and that your first responders know how to respond. Um, we don't want our um, practices to involve trauma during the school year. So the drills uh, more or less for first responders would be during the summer. And then um, our practices are for our school age kids are more are less trauma um, involved. So then we want to ut utilize our technology that we have we want to leverage it to enhance communication and coordinate between the schools and community responders. This can include um, communication platforms, emergency no notification systems that we mentioned earlier, and data sharing tools such as Entrada Safety Suite for education. And then last, evaluate and adjust. 
regularly assess effectiveness of your partnerships through feedback, analysis, and evaluation. Use information to make adjustments and improvements to the collaboration. Catherine, it's yours. Well, that actually, what, <laughs> the slides were one out of order, so I already covered that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think you're right. I, thanks. Um, so as I, as I mentioned, we want to practice the emergency protocols that we have in place. At the beginning of each school year, that's the ideal time, as Catherine mentioned, to practice emergency response protocols and invite those stakeholders and make sure everyone's prepared. Um, ensure up-to-date response maps are posted in each classroom. I think we touched on that. And digital maps and tools, if applicable, are very important. And then, you know, one of the things that we, a lot of schools don't necessarily do, but I think it's important, is tabletop exercises. So you have your emergency response plan, put it to use, sit down, give your team a scenario, and, and iron out what you do right, what you do wrong, um, have a debriefing. It can be very informal. It doesn't have to be, you know, three hours long or whatever. It can be a short tabletop, but I think a tabletop exercises are very important. I and then again... Something. I have something all your add. emergency tools. Go right ahead, uh, Kathy. Tabletops. Um, part, of, part of my job, uh, I did a lot of tabletop exercises with school districts and individual campuses. Um, and I constructed the exercise. It had fluidity in it. Um, but, you know, basically, I would get with uh, a campus. I'll use this as an example. So I'm with a campus and we're going to drill and they would always want to, to do a tabletop on active shooter because that seems the most pressing so i would develop you know uh, uh, something for their school um perhaps a parent was was mad because their child got kicked off the a team or didn't get to sing with the choir or something like that and this this parent is uh, comes to the school with a gun so yeah, and I and and I think well, active active shooter preparedness is great, but we need to prepare for other scenarios such as that, such as absolutely um, domestic but situations. Doing that particular tabletop was very eye opening. Um, in one case, I had a principal who, uh, very small school, said he knew all the parents really, really well. Very gregarious, nice, big kind of huggy bear kind of a guy. Um, so during the tabletop, he decided to go talk to the parent. So the school is locked down and he decides to go out to the parking lot to talk to the parent. And when I talk about a tabletop being fluid. So what I had happen next was that the parent shot the principal and came in the building. Then what happened was their principal was gone. Everyone else looked to him to make the decisions. No one else knew what to do. They were all frozen with indecision. So it made it very, very clear that they had to develop multiple people who could lead a response like that and make decisions. And, and I think you know, and anybody that's worked in schools know that if it's going to happen, it's probably going to be when the principal is at a district meeting or at a conference or or something like that. So to your point, it's absolutely important. And I've been at schools myself where you ask, how do you put the school on lockdown or what do you do in an emergency? And they always look, well, I don't know. You know, I look to the principal. So it's important that every staff member is given that opportunity. And I'll go one step farther and say a lockdown. Anybody, in my opinion, should be able to call a lockdown in a school. I And I, I think I agree with you, although I think not all principals would. But uh, it's also important that other office staff that might have access to whatever the notification is for lockdown or evacuation feels empowered to do the lockdown or the evacuation. They know what to do. They know the circumstances to do it. And they, in the absence of their principal being there, that they do do it. One of the high profile shootings, a lockdown was never called 
because the principal and assistant principal were not in the office and actually were involved right. in with the shooter and the secretary and others in the office were frozen again. They didn't get on right. the intercom and say lockdown because they had never done it. It might not be a bad idea for everyone in an administrative office to practice doing a drill so that they're comfortable and confident about it. I agree a hundred percent. And I, I'd like to end my portion by saying, you know, um, I don't know, I'm not an expert in the field and I doubt there's very many that are, I'm on the other side of these webinars a lot. So hopefully we've given you at least a couple points to take away from this uh, as I learn every time I do these things. But I, I just want to say that I started in this field when we, when it was paper and pencil for visitors, for lockdowns or reunification. And then we worked our way up to um, that kind of piecemeal where you had, you know, a couple cameras here, different vendors and such, and you may have had um, intercoms and such. And now I'm to the point where I realize the importance of that integration and um, to talk to people such as in Toronto. And if you don't, have the budget right now. There's grants, there's several resources out there and at least talk to them and find out what's available and you can work towards that for your capital improvement projects and such. So um, as always, it's been great working with you, Catherine, and I'll turn it over to you. Well, I, I'm just gonna second what Bob said. You know, there's a, a lot of times schools have trouble finding the budget for some of these improvements, but even if you start doing one at a time, and then add them as you can. Um, it it you really have a good solution for keeping students safe at school. And you know your parents might be a little bit mad at you if their kid fails a class or doesn't get to play on the team. But if something happens and their uh, and their child is injured or killed, uh, that's a pretty big deal. So it's really important. Uh, not to put school safety on the back burner, but to keep it in the forefront as the year goes on. And thank you, Bob. Do we have any questions? Yeah, let me pull them up. Um, for those of you that may have joined a few minutes late into the webinar, um, if you do have any questions, please feel free to add them to the Q&A button in the kind of middle section of the Teams um, user interface. And it looks like we have a few. Um, how can schools utilize parent groups uh, to augment staff in emergency situations? Do you care if I grab that, Bob? You, you feel free. Uh, parent groups are a wonderful resource. Um, just for one, um, reunification. Um, if you're going to, especially if you're going uh, to stage reunification at another location, you know, you need people with, uh, directing traffic, you need people telling parents where to go, how to go. Um, and honestly, a, a, a parent with a staff member can be more effective because parents recognize parents, you know, sometimes uh, they want to push past the staff member, but if a parent's saying, hey, you know, this is what's going to happen, this is how it works, um, you can utilize uh, parents for that. Um, I think you could, even if you wanted to, find ways to utilize them during school drills. Um, I know sometimes uh, schools, I think most uh, state fire marshals say you're supposed to be doing one obstructed fire drill during the year. Uh, and I don't know, uh, I know schools I worked at, um, we never did them. I never did an uh, obstructed fire drill, but I heard about another school where they put like a uh, construction paper fire and taped it over a door so that when teachers got to that door, they had to go another way. And what the teachers did is they took the paper down and went out the door because that was their door and they thought they were supposed to. So you could utilize a parent group to help you uh, block those doors, you know, to stand at those doors and say, hey, this door is, there's a fire here. You can't come through this way. So that would be another way of utilizing them and, you know, utilizing them perhaps to even uh, 
tell, you know, communicate with other parents information you need them to know. Do you have anything, Bob? Well, I was going to to piggyback on that last comment. I like the idea of using parent groups to to pass on information from the school. Let's face it, we every school has a handout or maybe even um, a way to communicate with parents, an email or another platform. But a lot of times those are unread. I think the best way to get messages out is word of mouth. So if you communicate to those parent groups, sh they're sure to tell other parents um, anything important that you need to pass on. So um, parent groups are very important. Here's another one. Um, can you share best practices for conducting penetration penetration testing to assess the resilience of a school's security infrastructure? I can well, I, I can <laughs> take that. I mean, uh, I did those for a number of years, um, and I think there are groups out there that that do them. I know when I worked for the Texas Associate Association of School Boards. We had a risk management pool that about three-fourths of the school districts in Texas belong to. So we did that as a free service to them. And, and other schools in other states might find that they have that available to them as well. But, you know, the best practice is, number one, uh, nobody at the school should. I always informed local law enforcement that we were going to come do it. Because if someone saw us, I didn't want them to think, you know, we were a bad guy. Um, but I didn't tell anyone at the school, including the principal, because uh, I wanted it to be a real test where no one knew that on that particular day, someone was going to come and try to get in. And um, and then I just I just walked around until I could either get someone. Sometimes a student might let me in. And then, you know, that's another thing students need to be trained is that they're not allowed to open doors. I loved it when little kids would see me and they'd come to the door and they'd go, no, you have to go over there, you know, through the window. That was just great. You know, I could tell they'd been taught that lesson. Um, but sometimes staff would think I looked like somebody important and let me in. Um, and and sometimes I didn't get in at all. Uh, and and. If you test that a year, you know, once or twice a year, um, it can make a huge difference uh, in making sure that people we we know who's on our campus and we don't have people coming and going that we don't even know about. So I, I recommend these as well and conduct these um, someplace. I think Texas calls them intruder drills now. I think the word intruder is a little harsh, and I think um, when when we do them, what we do is. First, we attempt to gain entrance, whether it's through a side door or like Catherine said, somebody lets us in. Um, and the idea is number one, can we get in the building? And this is low trauma, by the way. Again, this is not somebody dressed in black with a backpack. This is just somebody that might look like a parent. So can we get in the door? If we get in, how long are we in before somebody approaches us? A lot of times, teachers, staff members, you know, they don't like the confrontation. And what I always say is it doesn't have to be a confrontation. It can just be, can I help you? And that alone will, you know, can determine if somebody belongs there or not. Oh, you know, you need to check in at the front desk. I'll walk you there or something like that. So yes, we conduct these and um, the results are really good. I think one of the biggest things is the students because, you know, especially the young ones, they're taught they're taught to, you know, be kind to adults. So we have to teach them, don't open the doors for anybody. But I, I think the these type of drills are important. Again, a low stress, no trauma type uh, yes. Uh, drill. Yes. Okay, here's another one. What type of training exercises should schools and community responders engage in together to enhance their coordination and communication? I'll let you take Can that. Can I take that one? Okay, go ahead, Catherine. No, no, I said you take it. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, you know, I, I kind of touched on it earlier. I think anytime you're going to use, um, and I keep touching on the word trauma, but if you're going to use simunitions or, or things like that, if, you know, in, in the old days they use smoke or, you know, um, police, you know, going down the hall in your school, those are great drills for the first responders. 
not so much for the school. So those types of drills, you can work with your, your um, partners during the summer. Uh, those are not designed so much for school. As far as your school drills, the lockdown drills, absolutely include them. Remember, it's your school and it's your drill, but include them and look for their recommendations when you're doing your drill. So it's important if you have SROs, especially if you have an SRO, it's important that they attend your drill. Um, I worked with a with a school in Texas, and over the summer, um, they co collaborated with their uh, lo local responders, several different local responder groups, because they wanted to do a, kind of an active shooter drill. Um, but they utilized the high it was high school kids from the drama department, so there was a script. Everybody, you know, knew what was going to happen. Every student was playing a role. Um, so there was no surprise in it for the kids and the kids were doing it because they wanted to do it. But it did offer that kind of real life simulation for law enforcement. Um, and I thought uh, I thought that was it, it was done well. Those things uh, can blow up on you if they're not done well. Exactly, and, and right, and I hate to simplify it, but I always, I always say you don't need to light the school on fire to practice a fire drill, and the same goes for lockdown drills, right? Yes, absolutely. Do we have any more? Nope, that was the last question. Okay. Um, Thank you everyone for joining today. And this will be a recorded webinar, so we will send out the slides and the recording once it's available. Thank you everyone again for your participation. Bob and Catherine, it was a pleasure to have you again. Thank you. Likewise. Take care Thank everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.